Good afternoon. I'm Rob Saldine, the Director of Ethics and Public Affairs at the University of Montana's Mansfield Center. Welcome to today's Mansfield Dialogue, a question of respect with political strategists Celinda Lake and Ed Goes. I'd also like to thank Brandy for interpreting for us today. Thank you, Brandy Reinhardt. Um, we shouldn't begin, I think, our session today without acknowledging the disturbing events in Ukraine. Here at the Mansfield Center, we are, of course, guided by the example and legacy of Senator Mike Mansfield. And a central aspect of that is the promotion of democracy, both here at home and abroad. So we certainly uh, condemn the actions taken by Russia, and we welcome the, the, the fairly widespread and bipartisan consensus we've seen in voicing support for Ukraine and condemnation of Putin. Uh, that consensus isn't perhaps quite as widespread as, as we might hope and expect in this kind of a situation, but uh, these days we'll, we'll take what we can get. Um, and I'd, I'd also maybe just add that having been, been glued to the events in Ukraine since yesterday evening, I'm uh, for one happy to take a little bit of a break from that and turn to another equally important topic, the state of our democracy here in the United States. And we've got two stars with us today to help in that effort. Celinda Lake is a Montana native and a leading pollster for Democratic and progressive candidates. She was one of two main pollsters for Joe Biden's presidential campaign and is the only Democratic pollster to have played a major role in defeating not one but two incumbent presidents. Celinda currently serves as president of Lake Research Partners, where she has polled and advised Democratic candidates across the country, including Montana's own John Tester and Steve Bullock. Um, but Despite her partisan affiliation, she has managed to work well with her Republican counterparts. So Celinda has, for example, co-authored a book, uh, What Women Really Want, with Kellyanne Conway, the, uh, the, 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 the famed GOP consultant and former counselor to President Trump. Uh, she's also, of course, worked closely with our other guest today, Ed Goes. Ed is widely recognized as one of the country's leading political strategists. He was uh, the program director for the 2008 Republican National Convention for John McCain, and he's president and CEO of the Terrence Group, one of the uh, most respected, uh, most successful survey research strategy shops on the Republican side. And so, like Celinda, on the Democratic side, Ed and the Terrence Group have uh, helped elect dozens of candidates um, to the United States House, to the Senate, uh, as well as countless statewide officials. And in recognition of their successful track record, Ed and his team have twice been honored as Republican pollster of the year by the American Association of Political Consultants. Um, he has also, I think it's worth noting, uh, at, at a Mansfield Center event, been deeply involved in efforts related to campaign ethics and promoting increased youth participation. Those are, those are certainly things we like here at the center. Um, and uh, for the last 20 years, Celinda and Ed have teamed up to lead the Georgetown University Institute of Politics and Public Service Battleground Poll, one of the country's most respected national political research programs. And it's my understanding um, that, that their uh, partnership is even evolving further beyond that and that they are now working on a book together. So it is a real honor to have them with us today for this Mansfield Dialogue. Um, by the way, if you'd like to support our work here at the center, we'd be thrilled. You can find a link to do so in the chat. Um, today, we are going to begin our session with a presentation from Celinda and Ed, but we'll have time for some Q&A following their remarks. And with that in mind, I invite you and uh, in fact, encourage you um, audience members out there to submit questions via the chat function. Uh, so uh, Celinda and Ed, welcome, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. And I really want to thank Ed for joining um, uh, me in this. And uh, Rob, thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm very, very excited uh, at the Mansfield Center and very excited about the directions that you're taking. And um, uh, having grown up in Montana and grown up actually as a teenage Republican, in fact, one of the things that Ed and I share is we both started out in the opposite party which I think is, is key to our friendship and our perspective on things. Um, but I remember Mike Mansfield and when I worked uh, on the Hill, remember the, um, 
really amazing leadership. And it is a, as you mentioned, it is a poignant moment to think about um, an era of such great leadership when we had Mansfield and Metcalf and uh, thinking about um, Senator Mansfield and Ambassador Mansfield's leadership as a diplomat, as a scholar, but also as a runaway, as a, uh, a veteran who lied about his age at 14 to get into the military um, and as a, a renegade in many ways. I also want to acknowledge his wife, Maureen, who for many of us who grew up in Montana, she was a leader for us as well. Also as someone who specializes in women in politics, I've always loved that uh, when he first ran for the house, Jeanette Rankin actually beat him. And then he came back to win the seat and run again. So that's a, a fun anecdote. And my own family moved to Montana in the forties from New York City. And Mike Mansfield had been shipped out to Montana to his aunt in Great Falls when his mother died. So uh, lots and lots of um, human side to this myth, what has become, I think for many of us, this great standard and mythic figure. So what we wanted to do today, and Rob, we're so glad to have you as the moderator, wanted to share a little bit with you from the Battleground poll and the newest iteration of that poll, which thanks to Mo Alithri and the um, Georgetown Institute of, of Public Policy and Public Service um, has really taken on a perspective of looking at civility and respect and where we are in the country at this era of deep polarization. We'll share a couple of slides with you. Both of us will comment on it. Then as, as you mentioned, we have been thinking together a lot about what is producing this unique period of incivility and division and what can we do about it? And each of us will present some thoughts on that and then really eager to open it up to questions and comments. And as you said, Rob, and thank you for that introduction. I mean, it's a very, very sobering time. And of course, growing up in Montana, under the, with all the missile silos, et cetera, all of us grew up with uh, the duck and cover drills and uh, don't take lightly a, a war engagement with the Soviet Union and Russia. So uh, it is something we grew up with and we're very aware of in our youth. And I'm sure Ed will share with you the formative influence of his dad who was in the military, professional military and thinking about some of the same things. So it's a sobering time to be having this conversation. I think Rob, you were gonna load the slides and we'll show them. Uh, people can also get these slides if they want and they are also posted on um, the Institute of Politics website. Uh, this is from a poll of likely national um, voters um, it is a thousand people poll. It is um, uh, one that we have conducted periodically. It started out 20 years ago as a very unique effort uh, where we each wrote our own questions and then came together. And then we each wrote our own analysis. And unlike a lot of bipartisan polls that you will see where they come to a joint analysis, the beauty of this poll is you get both of our perspectives and we don't share our perspectives with each other until we have completed our own work. So it's a, it's a very unique poll in that regard and it's all archived. So uh, we would encourage you to um, look at it. But uh, the biggest thing that we have been seeing since we started this tracking of civility, incivility, division, unity, respect in the polling, if we look at the next slide, is on a scale from zero to 100, where zero is there's no political division in the country and 100 is po political division, we are on the edge of civil war, where would you rank the level of political division in the country? And you can see these means, we've been doing this since April of 2019, and you can see in the most current rating, the mean is 70.36, really an astounding level of division and the public very, very, very concerned about it. This is also something that uh, people bipartisanly agree with and every demographic group in every region of the country agrees that we are perilously close to being so divided that we would be at civil war. If you look at the next slide, you can see the time series represented visually and you can see a little bit of a decline from the peak in January of 2021, 
but really, really high levels of thinking that we are at political division. And I think as um, both Democrats and Republicans on this call and independents and third party supporters, because we have all of that in Montana, um, all of us are very, very concerned about the level of political division. We also looked, if you look at the next slide, about where people think the division is going. From zero, there's be no political division a year from now. To 100, we will be on the edge of civil war. And again, the most current mean, 68.32. People thinking it improving a little bit, but not very much. And if you look at the next slide, you can see again, a really dramatic projection for the future as well as for the present. So people are very, very um, sobered. It is making finding political will quite difficult. It is really fueling cynicism and a sense that really dedicated public servants on both sides of the aisle won't be able to get anything done because the divisions are so great. It has also affected people's personal behavior. And I think a lot of Montanans have experienced this um, where people say they have unfriended friends and family members and um, try to avoid the conversations about what is going on in the country because it is so divisive. If we look at the next slide, January 6th, obviously representing a really key turning point. And of course, people's attitudes about January 6th are shifting right now. And as more and more evidence and documentation is revealed, people are moving from thinking this was one episode uh, that will never happen again to this was something that could happen again and we must not allow it. 58% of the public say they think that the events of January 6th made it more likely that we will have violent political protests in the future. If we look at the next slide, uh, we um, asked, has COVID contributed to <clears throat> lack of civility in our politics and division? And people think the division definitely predated COVID. They also think, and, and Ed is quite eloquent on this, about whether uh, Trump is the symptom or the result. But that said, um, people believe overwhelmingly that um, COVID has made things less civil and more divided. And they think of it as kind of a unique crisis in that regard because other crises historically in our past, we have been a country that came together in crises like 9-11. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with the current crisis in Ukraine. If we look at the next slide, uh, we also see that since Joe Biden has become president, you think politics has become more civil, less civil, or about the same. And 43% say less civil, 29 more, 27 about the same. But um, people believe that Joe Biden wanted unity, but they are very, very mixed about his success in being able to achieve it. And then there is a partisan overlay to that as well. Finally, the last slide I'll show you and uh, our hope for the future. And one of the reasons we were in, very, very interested in talking to the Mansfield Institute because of your connection to young people and um, the future. We asked the question, do you agree or disagree with this statement? I am optimistic about the future because young people are committed to making this country a better place to live for everyone. And you see 58% of the public agreeing, 26% strongly, 38% disagreeing, 22% strongly. Ironically, the two groups that agree with this statement the most are the very youngest voters and the oldest voters. And the voters who are most cynical are actually Generation X, uh, perhaps as Ed has hypothesized, because these were young people who, who many people were relying on for the future and they have been kind of the lost generation because of the number of crises they've faced already in a very short time. So if that's kind of the overview, uh, let me turn it over to Ed. And I think I said 1,000 registered voters. I meant to say 800 registered voters. And you can see the error is plus or minus 3.5%. But Ed, let me turn it over to you 
for um, your analysis. Not to say it's it's always a privilege to be with Celinda. Um, actually, we've been doing the battleground for 30 years as opposed to 20 years. Um, it's funny, one of my partners at the end of the first 10 years that we were together used to make the comment that we had lasted longer than most Washington marriages, and now we've gone triple that time. So we've certainly gone longer than most uh, Washington marriages um, that is there. Um, I'm going to maybe go off on the charts a little bit into a couple of things that, that are, uh, have, have driven my thoughts. Um, first of all, I do feel very strongly that our country is in a death spiral in terms of incivility. Very concerned about that. Uh, it led me to wanting to do the fellowship at Georgetown in 2018 um, uh, on civility, uh, which has led to kind of looking at this issue closer as during the battleground, uh, expanded beyond just political and into the area of civility um, and talking about it. Um, and it's been very interesting. I, I also believe that Trump is not the disease. I think he's just a symptom of the disease. And the reason why I feel that way is so many people, um, uh, so someone at the door, um, so many people that um, they accepted Trump for the way he was. Now, at the time Trump came out, um, I currently have a 12 year old son and a 17 year old son. They were four years younger, five years younger. Um, hold on one second. Come on in, I'm on the phone. Um, and uh, when Trump came along, I had a real problem with in any way um, being positive towards Trump uh, because he was um, uh, represented everything I was trying to teach my sons not to be. Um, but I didn't go the route of some of the Republicans that started the Lincoln Group or the Lincoln Project. Um, and I did speak out. Um, I tried to be civil in the way I did it. Um, I was asked once on a Fox show before he was even president um, what I thought of Donald Trump and was in a position, I was in studio actually delivering a battleground survey and was in a position of, do I say what I really think or do I sugarcoat it? Um, and I said, from what I saw of Donald Trump, I thought he was a man of a limited philosophical compass and a questionable moral compass. Um, I thought I was sugarcoating it. Uh, Trump was watching that show and did not think I was sugarcoating it. Um, so we've, ha we've had an interesting relationship over the last five years. Um, uh, but he, um, he is disappointing. I saw one of the questions already is about his statements on Russia, which I just, uh, I grew up as a military brat, um, which we always use as a symbol of honor. Um, and my father spent his last five years uh, in Europe with the inspector general inspecting our nuclear missiles uh, in Europe. And to have a president make a comment like that is just hard to even believe uh, could be made. But take me, let me take you back to kind of the basics of incivility. And, and I think part of our focus of the book is that there are so many tools today that are stirring that pot of incivility. Um, uh, I think a lot of it is driven uh, by a misunderstanding of so many of our elected officials on problem solving. Um, problem solving goes through five, st four stages. You talk about the problem, you talk about solutions, you implement solutions, and that creates a new set of problems. And we have gone through that cycle so many times that we're dealing with problems created by our solutions and not the root problems. And that creates incivility uh, or creates a cynicism amongst the voters. And the one thing I have noticed over the years is that Cynical voters are the, although they think they're kind of standing up against things wrong being happening, they are the most susceptible to demagoguery and demagogues, whether it be candidates or social media or, or the cable news programs of which all three cable networks after eight o'clock at night is almost pure demagoguery. And there's those tools that are out there, super PACs, 
that are really driving so much of the negativism and cynicism through demagoguery and the way they're saying it. And quite frankly, using a lot of misinformation on doing it. So I, I think it is something we can do. Uh, one of the interesting things I wanted to throw out before, I know I'm supposed to keep to about seven minutes, which is hard for any pollster. Um, but one of the things we started off was to talk about civility in our book and to address civility. Um, and we came to an understanding after a few months of working on the issue that civility is just the language of respect. And that's why we've changed the title to a question of respect. And so much in our environment today, um, people did not listen to each other about what differing opinions are. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you do need to treat it with respect to have a civil discussion kind of moving forward. Um, I wanna mention one last thing that we are not addressing in the book, but maybe in the next book, is that one of the interesting things um, as we were doing the research is I saw the scatter maps on the ideology of members of Congress. And if you go back to 1980, 1990 time period, um, a scatter map on the ideology of members of Congress was fairly evenly distributed from the left to the center to the right. Today, when you look at that ideological uh, scatter map, it's almost all on the far right and the far left. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to think about in terms of our current system is that you have basically in a primary today, about 20% of Republicans voting in Republican primaries and about 20% of Democrats voting in Democratic primaries. And it's the ideologues, the strongly, uh, strongly conservative, strongly liberals voting in the primaries. And that's the candidates we're putting forward. And I think unfortunately uh, today we are seeing very few of our candidates that are true centrists that, that do come from the middle where they are listening to both sides and looking at the best solutions. And so I think any discussion of improving civility in this country may have, have to take a very hard look at how do we get included more candidates that represent the centrist of the country and not just the far left and the far right. Linda. Thanks, Ed, for those comments. So uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about a little bit are what are some of the solutions and what are the ways uh, to that all of us can play a role in finding some of these solutions to incivility. And Ed has talked about some of them already in terms of recruiting candidates. And there are a variety. Uh, one of the things is we started to do the book, we realized that um, in politics, which we consider public service, both of us are dreaded political consultants, uh, but we consider it a real badge of honor. We, uh, frankly, we work for people who could make a lot more money and have a lot better lives if they were not such dedicated public servants on both sides of the aisle. And certainly Mike Mansfield um, exemplified that. But um, some of the incentive structures are the way we raise money. The way we raise money definitely, um, and as we move to more small donor contributions, it definitely increases the polarization. One of the things that is interesting in the book that we're doing is we don't always have the same solutions, but we often have some of the same analysis of the problems. And that is something that I think can be very interesting to think about what other solutions are there out there. A second factor, which we've just come out of is uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. The incentives now on both sides of the aisles is to protect incumbents, to have non-competitive districts, districts that are competitive in primaries, but not in general elections. And that makes for much more divisive politics as well. The third thing that we uh, spend a lot of time on, and I think it will be very, very interesting for the conversation in this forum, because it's the first time we've taken some of these ideas public, is social media. And Ed tells, and I'll, I'll let him tell it, but he tells a very interesting story when he was uh, exploring this with young people for whom social media, as we know, is really their first language. 
that after the civility ceremony or civility seminar, I mean, several of his students remarked that they changed the way they thought about their behavior in terms of what they forwarded or how they responded to something. Social media is really, and cable news, frankly, for that matter, as Ed mentioned earlier in his remarks, really incentivized division, polarization. They're trying to get um, likes and the era of the great reporters and the Walter Cronkites just doesn't exist anymore. People are vying for two and three percentage uh, additions to the marketplace rather than leading the country with 28, 40% of the marketplace. And it's leading to really polarizing encounters. And then people are feeding into it. And it turns out that people have very low uh, ability. And I think it's something that the Mansfield Institute could really delve into. How do we confront the polarization on social media? How do we hold the platforms more accountable for what they carry, including misinformation, and still maintain our commitment to free speech? How do we have a democracy where you don't have a Walter Cronkite uh, providing a fact-based um, common understanding of a situation? And in fact, we just finished um, some research that we we're doing with a group on women voters. And we found that facts had very, very little impact on people's decision-making. Um, that for swing women voters, um, facts were way, way down in part because people have a very, very hard time figuring out what are the facts. They have no trusted sources. And sometimes the sources that they trust, friends and family, um, aren't really providing that accurate of information. And I think maybe all of us, I can certainly speak for myself. I have had a situation where I have forwarded to my staff and friends a social media posting that I really thought was getting me really fired up. And people, you know, someone would email back to me, usually a younger staffer and say, you know, that's not true, right? And it was like, no, I don't know that's not true. I wouldn't have forwarded it had I had any idea it wasn't true. Um, so even I am having difficulty and regular voters having a great deal of difficulty sorting out information and misinformation, who can be reliable, trusted sources. So we're looking at the incentive structures in politics and trying to figure out whether it's money, redistricting, getting votes, um, being on cable news shows, being a reporter on a cable news show, use of social media, both personally and institutionally, how can we change the incentive structures so that we're not uh, indirectly all becoming part of the problem of division in, and polarization in this country? How can we contribute to uh, more civility and more respect and more civil conversation? Uh, Ed, let me turn it back to you for additional thoughts and then we'll open it up to everybody's questions and Rob to your questions. Oh, Ed, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Okay, I will try to uh, keep it a little bit short because I see the questions kind of building up. Um, but I think a, a couple of things I'm seeing out there, um, and we're seeing it again in this election cycle. Um, one is that the, um, and, and you see it on both the, the far right and the far left, um, that uh, they justify being uncivil because they say the other side is being that way. And so it becomes almost a nuclear arms war. Um, of who can be the nastiest, who can be the ugliest, and who, who can use those tools the most. Um, that's where it has to kind of come back to a matter of respect, not just in terms of hearing each other, but uh, kind of understanding the process of problem solving so that you don't get into the trap there. It's, it's interesting. One of the examples that I know I'm in the book going to be uh, taking a position against the filibuster and with some suggestions on the filibuster. Um, and I, I've always found the filibuster, quite frankly, and again, this is both the right and the left has been uh, responsible for this in recent years. They use the filibuster to keep the other side from accomplishing anything to get credit. 
as opposed to using it to, as George Washington said to Tom, uh, George Washington said to Thomas Jefferson when he first asked the question, why did you build in the Senate? And his comment was to pour the tea in the saucer and let it cool. Um, there was an understanding that in that four step process of problem solving, you need to stop at that third step, slow down for a minute and ask the question, is our solution gonna make things worse as opposed to make things better? And what are the problems that will come from this solution? Um, we don't use it to slow down. We use it to stop each other uh, in terms of the process. And I think that then just adds to the cynicism of the voters, which adds to the incivility of the voters. And I think that is, that, that is highly unfortunate. Um, but the other is you're hearing these screams right now on both sides um, of, and you look at the primaries. Um, I have several very well, uh, uh, very good incumbent senators who travel the district, talk to the voters, spend a lot of time focusing on getting input from the voters. Um, and they're getting criticized in primaries for one and only one reason, that they're not perceived as fighting hard enough and shouting hard enough for, the, for their side. Um, and I see the same things from, from the left. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because they're being driven by their primary campaigns to justify actually um, being more civil. Um, and I think we need to be speaking out about those kind of challengers that get involved in the primaries that are just trying to drive uh, and, and make points by being even angrier, even louder, and even further to the right or further to the left. So let me stop there. I know we have a lot of questions and I think the ones I've seen so far are fairly interesting. So uh, let's let's walk through. So Linda and Ed, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, and Ed, you're right. We do have a number of questions. I actually want to start with uh, one of my own before uh, getting to as many of these as we can. That's always <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> to, uh, to, to just ask a, a more basic question, you know, how does one become a political consultant? Um, oh. What are your paths uh, to your positions. And I, I ask that partly because I always have a lot of students here at the University of Montana who are interested in working uh, in, in politics or in one capacity or another. And, and do you have any advice for people who aspire to do the kind of work that, that, you've, that you do? Salona, do you wanna take that one first? Uh, sure. So actually on the call, and it's so great to connect, are some of the people who were really formative for me, Tom Rolf actually is on the on the call, and he was the first person to get me involved in volunteering in Republican politics, actually, um, and was a real mentor to me. And uh, then a number of people like Kelly Addy and Wilbur Raymond and others who are on the call that um, were really supportive throughout my career. Um, the there are all all kinds of ways people enter it through. Um, being involved in campaigns, being involved with the committees. I was involved in both. I also got academic training. A number of people do not get academic training when there are gonna be a pollster, but for me, it was very helpful to take some statistics and survey research. And I have it several degrees from the University of Michigan in that regard. And, uh, but I think that um, uh, all of us have, inter all of the political consultant firms have internships, many of them are paid modestly paid, but still it's a start. Um, getting involved in campaigns is a very helpful way. Working as a volunteer for either the Republican or Democratic party. And one of the things that's great about uh, getting involved in campaigns, particularly if you do it early, and don't necessarily pick the highest profile race. Um, sometimes getting in a local race, you can do even more because they need the help so much that you can really, um, take on increasing responsibility if you just work hard and do smart work and be careful and energetic about your work. Um, but there are lots and lots of entree points. It's, it's not a very uh, closed profession, actually. It's quite open profession. I will put in a plug for polling. One of the things I love about polling, particularly if you're a woman or a person of color, is that you get to sit at the table very early on 
and you have a base of authority. A lot of times politics relies on being personally powerful and that's sometimes harder for women and people of color to obtain that power. But the great news about polling is people will, you know, they'll, they'll fuss and fume and all this stuff and then they'll turn to the pollster and say, well, Ed or Celinda, what does the poll say? Uh, what's the, the, what are the voters reacting to right now? So polling is a fantastic profession for being able to have an early seat at the table and to be able to base your comments on knowledge and experience. But just acquiring experience in campaigns, um, and you can go the route of the manager, you can go the route of the media consultant, social media consulting firms are taking off and are huge right now. So I would suggest work on a campaign, take an internship, take a course on statistics um, or politics. Um, there are lots and lots, uh, find a mentor, lots and lots of entree points. It's not a very closed profession. <laughs> um, my answer, um, I worked in my first campaign when I was 12. Uh, 1964. Um, I was Catholic back in those days and thought if you're a Catholic uh, because of John Kennedy, you were supposed to be a Democrat. And most of my family was. Um, my father was in Vietnam, which is why I went and volunteered in the Lyndon Johnson campaign. Um, and quite frankly, got adopted by some college girls that work in the campaign that thought, thought, okay, poor little kid, his dad's in Vietnam and just fell in love with it. Um, uh, I grew up with a speech impediment. Um, and so I learned one important lesson when you're first getting in politics is uh, keep your mouth shut and listen, you'll learn a lot. Um, and if you focus on working instead of just talking, uh, even though it may be interested, interesting to get in those debates, uh, it gets noticed. Um, I went a much different route than Celinda. Um, I was in college in Oklahoma and was convinced to leave college seven hours short um, to go manage a congressional race at uh, 21 years old. Um, so it is a very open profession. Um, they're always looking for people to come uh, in working on it. Um, and I finally got my degree three years ago. Uh, when I went back 50 years later uh, and picked up the last couple of uh, things I had to pick up. Um, I would say, you, you know, that there's an opening. It all comes for, you know, putting yourself out there, um, much like you do as a candidate. And uh, there's always a need for more and more people. Uh, one of the things about working campaigns is that it is, very uh, time consuming um, in terms of your life. Um, if you get on with one of the committees, there's a lot of travel uh, involved in it. And if you're willing to kind of put yourself out there, there's always gonna be uh, an opportunity to step up. Uh, if anything I can say, most campaigns I've looked at are vastly understaffed, vastly understaffed. Um, and so there's always gonna be a place for you uh, just keep your eyes open. Great, thanks, Ed and Celinda. Let's get to uh, the audience questions. Uh, Steve Levine, a friend of the center, asks, how can you have respect and dialogue with followers of QAnon and conspiracy theorists, some of whom may be <laughs> in Congress? I don't know, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you don't have to have respect for everyone. You just have to have respect for enough people on the other side of this part of the process that you can kind of find places of, of compromise, if you will. Um, uh, there is certainly, in, in, as we've gone through this process, uh, there's a lot where Celinda have talked about the problem in a we voice. Uh, but we then talk about solutions in an I voice because we have very different kind of feelings on solutions. Um, but if in fact you can get to a point that you're thinking about the problem in a we voice, uh, you'll, you'll find that the I voice becomes a matter of constructive uh, building as opposed to constructive tearing apart. 
I think you can have respect for the individual too, without agreeing with the idea. And that's something that's really gotten lost here. And I think that, um, you know, um, uh, voters believe right now that any three people in America can agree on more than the political system does. And I tend to think that's right, or at least for 99% of the voters. And we give some examples in the book of like um, Maisie Hirona, uh, and a liberal, very liberal senator from Hawaii, working with Don Young, a very conservative senator, uh, congressman from Alaska on education for indigenous people. Um, we give the uh, example of the national, the biggest bill that revised foster care was actually a bill co-authored by Hillary Clinton and Tom DeLay, a conservative out of Texas, both of whom very, very committed. Tom DeLay, very religious and out of his faith, uh, actually was very involved in fostering himself. He and his wife were very involved in fostering and realized there were just some places that the system didn't work. So I think not starting out thinking that everything is um, necessarily left or right. Some are just problems that need to be fixed. No one would think this would work. Um, the uh, When the original uh, ACA was put forward in the dead of night, there was a small provision that was snuck into the committee that would have made um, small businesses file records on every financial transaction they occurred. Well, in, in doing any given poll, we do dozens and dozens of financial transactions. That would just break small business. And... Um, uh, Senator Bagich then from Alaska called me and said, I'm literally the only small business person in the caucus here. I spotted this. We've got to move. Can you get to Senator Baucus's staff? And I said, yes, I think I can. This would be insane. Uh, it may be a good idea. And I understand what they're trying to do to capture some of the underground economy, but this implementation would break the back of every small business out there. Um, so sometimes they're just common sense. And then recruiting people from a variety of backgrounds so that there is a small business owner in every caucus who can say, listen, this just doesn't work if you're a small business. You can't possibly, you know, you'd have an accounting department bigger than your business if you tried to implement this. I, I would also add um, one of my favorite stories is uh, my wife's, uh, the, the senator she's chief of staff for, Joni Ernst was working with Cinder Gildebrand out of New York on uh, sexual abuse or sexual assault in the military. Um, and they spent two years on it before the 20 election came up. Um, Cinder Gildebrand was running for president. Um, Joni was running for reelection and Gildebrand endorsed Joni's general election opponent, um, even though they'd been working together for two years. But Joni kind of shrugged her shoulder and says, that's politics and she's running for president. And that's what she was told she needed to do. And when the election was over and <clears throat> Jill DeBrand was no longer running for president and Joni had been reelected, they got back together, spent another year on it and got it passed. So some of it is, um, again, uh, the politics are gonna be out there. Um, you just have to, at some point, be able to set that aside when it's no longer the time for those politics and time for real solutions. Great, I'm going to uh, combine a number of questions here. Uh, Rebecca asks about uh, the plausibility of a third party, a, uh, a kind of centrist third party. To what extent is that uh, potentially part of the solution here? Uh, David Bell, our board chair, asks about the possibility of uh, reforming uh, the, the, the way in which congressional districts are gerrymandered. Is that potentially part of the solution? And we've had several questions in here about the role of money in politics. So but between a third party gerrymandering, money in politics, um, are, are there any solutions there? And to what extent is that part of our problem? Let me first, and I'll let Celinda go, go first, but we, we, we address all three of those in our book. So good questions, Celinda. Yeah, I think there are solutions in all of the areas. And it's interesting, in some of those areas, we agree about the solutions and some like campaign finance reform, um, we have different solutions, but all of us can agree on the problem. And um, 
you know, my, uh, I have to salute, I, I've been watching all the questions and salute the Montanans because we have a strong tradition of fighting um, in our state, corporate money and politics. And I, I just wanna salute our state for being such a leader on that. But there are definitely structural solutions that can be uh, brought to bear. I think there are also uh, informal solutions to their structures. And, you know, um, repeatedly the women senators have gotten together bipartisanly and been able to uh, solve different problems, even at crisis points, uh, like when the budget was stuck. And um, part of that is because from the very beginning, since there were six senators, um, the women senators meet informally for dinner, potluck dinner. Um, it's completely off the record. There has never been a leak out of those meetings. Uh, almost all the senators attend, if not all of them. And it's been a way to form the kinds of friendships that can end the relationships so that you actually know people on the other side of the aisle. I think one of the things that's been so hard about the COVID era is people are not encountering people um, nearly as much. They're not interacting. And that interaction leads to respect and civility. Um, boy, a couple of things. I, I, I love the gerrymandering and, and Salon and I disagree on this, um, uh, mainly because I've been very involved in it from a different perspective. Um, uh, the Democrats have always kind of gone after Republicans from a racial standpoint on gerrymandering when the problems with gerrymandering that are created is more a political problem than a racial problem. Uh, and I say that because uh, starting in 1990, we started reaching out as Republicans to the African-American community because basically what we saw the Democrats doing was spreading the African-American vote into multiple districts in order to up the Democratic vote. And we basically went to them and said, uh, if you want more African-American members, not Democrat members, but African-American members, um, there is a way to kind of stop this spreading out the, uh, the vote and concentrating it more on, on a community level that makes sense. Uh, when we started that in 1990, uh, about three and a half percent of Congress was African-American. Um, in 2020, um, we're getting ready to do it again. We are through the 2020 election. <coughs> we are at almost 13 percent of, uh, of Congress is African-American, which is 3.3 percent more than the population. So they are now representative of the population in a way they were not before. Um, but we, we do get blamed a little bit for damned if you do and damned if you don't, um, which is interesting, I think, uh, the way we addressed it in the book. Uh, the problem on money, I think, is even bigger um, than I think some people assume from my perspective, and I say this as a campaign strategist, is that what happened in campaign finance reform is they were trying to lower the amount of money in the parties um, and what was being done uh, on money through the parties, which was more of a more of a Republican advantage, admittedly. Um, but in effect, what we did was kill, um, kill the parties, both Democrat and Republican, in a very large way. Um, if you look today, almost every state chairman is on a salary, uh, where before it was people that stepped up that were willing to kind of give to the party. Um, and that has changed the mode. Uh, more importantly, because of super PACs, first of all, I think super PACs does have a, um, a, a kind of approach um, of they do the dirty work, they're supposed to be doing the negative. But I think the bigger impact is, and this leads to the more negative campaigns, is that if you're in a campaign today, um, you're lucky if you have 25% of the message uh, because you have your message, you have the super PAC message for you, the super PAC message for your opponent and your opponent's campaign. And so, uh, especially since uh, super PACs raise so much more money on both sides, um, in fact, if you look at the super PAC money in the last election, um, actually, 
uh, you had uh, Biden getting almost twice as much as what Trump had. And at the Senate level, it was three times as much in the Republican Senate campaigns as it was in the Republican campaigns. So there's a lot of uh, saying that it's big business or it's this or it's that, but that's not the reality. Um, my solution, Celinda, of course, would like to get it down to small contributions. Um, my feeling about it is we saw with the last campaign finance reform is it's a balloon that um, you squeeze on one end and it gets bigger on the other end, but it never gets smaller um, in terms of total mass. And, and I am a big believer that what we saw in the Virginia uh, process is they allow unlimited contributions to the campaigns. They didn't do away with PACs, but unlimited contributions to the campaigns that are instantly reportable. And what has happened is that the super PACs in Virginia have been get, getting less and less and less money because people are gonna give the money directly to the candidates, um, uh, which makes sense because then the candidates are controlling their message. And then the candidates can be hold, held that much more responsible for the type of campaign they're running. Um, and that is so much of what's leading to the incivility today in campaigns and it needs to change and it needs to happen quickly. Bill Beecher raises uh, the question about bipartisan groups being established in Congress. And I know you touched on this a little bit, Celinda, but I think Bill has in mind uh, maybe more formal uh, organizations, formal institutions. Uh, you know, we had uh, the two leaders of the Problem Solvers Caucus mm -hmm. a dialogue for us, uh, I think about a year ago, right? The, the, the Democratic leader and the Republican leader. There, there are other organizations in this space um, as, as well, some outside of Congress, like No Labels is trying to uh, organize in this area. Um, what do you think is the, the, the possibility of that? And part of that, I, as I conceive of it, would be like a, a return to something like the, the, the Senate of Mike Mansfield, who of course was known uh, for being very effective at working across the aisle, particularly with his Republican counterpart, F. Dirksen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a big question. Um, and I think that um, the current polarization has made it more problematic. Um, the, uh, at, but right now, honestly, um, the other thing that's the problem is the divisions within the boat in the two parties before we even get to the two parties talking to each other. So when you ask voters, for example, are the Republicans holding things up in the Congress? Um, a lot of Democratic voters will say, no, it's Manchin and Cinema that are holding things up uh, in, this, in the Congress. So um, I think there, is, um, there are tensions within each um, uh, party's coalition uh, that are making it really, really hard to even talk about a cross-party uh, uh, cooperation. And... Um, you also had the situation where we're now headed into primary season and these primaries can be pretty bitter face-offs. You have the, with redistricting, you have the new Dems fighting the Congressional Progressive Caucus pretty aggressively. Similarly on Ed's side, I wouldn't even presume to be an expert on Republican primaries, but you have some really intense fights between the MAGA faction and, and other Republicans. So, um, it's really, really complicated, I think, right now. And I don't, but I, I guess I would say, I don't think it's just bipartisan groups. I think there are divisions within each party that are pretty aggressive as well and that are contributing to the polarization. I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I think Celinda, I don't want to put words in Celinda's mouth, but Celinda has a little bit more of a problem in that she is a, she is a progressive. And so she sees that from a little bit different angle uh, perhaps in her party. I I've been teasing her for several years that the pro progressives are the tea party of the left. Um, mm -hmm. And I see, the tea, I see the progressives kind of moving in a direction where they're, instead of going after Republicans, they're going after old time Democrats because they know if they win that district, they can keep it longer. Um, which is exactly what the Tea Party did in 2010, 2012. It is interesting if you look at 
the 2018 campaign when we lost control of Congress. Um, we didn't just lose it because of Trump. And yes, the suburban women had taken a step away from Trump that were leaning more Republican. But we had enough suburban Republican districts that were represented by um, more centrist Republicans who had been moving a little bit further to the right to keep from having a tough primary um, uh, because they were getting pressure from the Tea Party. And I think the Tea Party and moving those members further to the right uh, had as much to do with losing control of Congress as Donald Trump did in 2018. Um, and one of the surprises in 2020 was even though Trump went down, we actually won a lot of congressional seats, mainly in those, those suburban districts that we won back. And we won them back by running more centrist candidates and a lot of candidates of color and female uh, candidates in those, in those districts. Yeah. Well, we unfortunately only have time for one more question. And I, I do really apologize to everyone who asked questions that we uh, were not able to get to. There, there were a lot of great ones, um, uh, but we only have so much time. And I'd, I'd like to close, Celinda and Ed, with um, a question just about the state of polling out there. You know, Chelsea mm -hmm. brings up some of the mechanical issues revolving around the polling industry. Uh, Laura Morris asks, um, you know, kind of to, to, to what extent can we trust polling these days? And of course, polling has had a, a, a rocky few years with some ups and downs. There are uh, concerns that there are some kind of systematic problems that, that, that certain swaths of the country are perhaps um, dismissive of polling altogether, uh, are going to refuse to engage in polls or even perhaps give incorrect answers on purpose, right? So, so um, and, and that's on top of uh, just fewer and fewer people being willing to participate in polls these days. Um, and and there, are, there, there are other issues. And I know these are things that as pollsters, you, you have to grapple with and constantly be attuned to. But, but how would you assess the current state of polling and the extent to which we can rely on polling now and in the future as we have in the past? Let me, let me start off with that, Slenda. You, you have the... the um, we did the Youngkin campaign for governor in Virginia. And our last poll, which was which finished on Sunday before the Tuesday election, had Youngkin at 2.1% and he got 2.4%. Um, I think part of the problem is that the bad news has kind of come from the public polls that are number one, being misused. Number two, uh, very often they are finishing polling a week out so they can then get those polling numbers in the stories in the newspaper or whatever. Um, 2016 is a great example of that. Um, they started after the 2016 election criticizing polling because the polling said that Hillary Clinton was gonna win and she didn't. Then they found out that the final polls, national polls said she was going to uh, have went by 4% and she won by 3% in terms of uh, the total population. Um, then they started saying, well, what about the state polls then? And they start looking at those and the state polls were off. They were off because they stopped, the last night they were in the field was on Tuesday before the Tuesday election, seven days before the election. We were in the field in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, um, Florida, Ohio, uh, five different states that on Tuesday night when we did the first poll, um, Trump was either uh, slightly down or down right outside the margin of error. And then we went Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and by Friday, when we were looking at the total number, Trump was tied in Pennsylvania and he was slightly ahead in, in all the other states and he won those states. And it was that the FBI report had an impact on the voters and the polls that were out in the field and finished on the Tuesday one week before totally missed it. They weren't wrong. They were just being misreported by saying 
the day before the election that they represented the day before the election when they didn't. And so I think we've had to take a hit, but the bottom line is most of our polling, as long as we're doing it till the very last minute, and there's different changes we've had to make on how many cell interviews we do um, that we've had to modify as we go through um, to keep up. But we're usually within, <laughs> largely within the margin of error because quite frankly, if we weren't, we wouldn't be able to stay in business. Um, and if we didn't do it correctly, we wouldn't win to even have clients to stay in business. So I think it's been kind of a bad rap that quite frankly is misreporting by the reporters that want to use polling to create, because quite frankly, some of them get lazy and they want to use the polling to, uh, as an excuse for why they're writing a certain article, um, when in fact the polling isn't saying anything like that. I think Ed said it well. And uh, the other thing that we're struggling with and that we will be, you'll see be a real um, test for the 2022 elections is the turnout models. The polling is, is um, really, really dependent on who turns out to vote. And that is often something. And I think a lot of the Democratic polling, frankly, has underestimated the surge on the Republican side. Or in Virginia, for example, how supercharged the Trump voters were. And um, in our firm, for example, and a lot of the private firms, we have increasingly um, adopted methodologies to take um, account of that. So uh, there, it, it is more difficult to poll, but I think the private polls are a lot more accurate than the public polls would lend you to believe. And if, if I could add on to that, because I, I think it is something, a trap that the Democrats fell into a little bit of trying to pull a sample based on what they think the electorate will be. We don't do that on our side. <laughs> we pull out a sample that we only take out people who say they're definitely not going to vote. And then we do a lot of intensity questions that mm -hmm. we develop models um, on based on intensity and some of the other demographic questions that are there that are very predictive. And it's something all of us use, both sides use, 20 years ago. And for some reason during the Obama years, uh, there seemed to be a drop off of that. Um, I always thought it was interesting when uh, Obama won re-election, uh, they told two stories. They understood what the electorate was gonna be and they did a better job turning out their voters. Well, it can't be both. <laughs> you either had polling that said what the electorate was gonna be, or you did a better job turning out the voters because you knew you had to do that to, to have a lead. Um, and that led to a lot of people, including quite frankly, public polls, that they try to pull the sample. In that Yunkin campaign, I'll give you a great final story. In that Yunkin campaign, Fox News came out showing Yunkin leading by 14 points when we knew it was a couple of points and some intensity in our favor. Donald Trump came out and said, I see this election is close, so I'm going to go into Northern Virginia and put this campaign over the top. He wasn't going in to put it over the top. He was going in to take credit for having won that campaign. And I tell you, everything short of threatening to arrest him at the border coming in, uh, we kept him from doing it. Uh, he ended up doing a Zoom rally of which we made sure hardly anyone watched. Um, and certainly the press didn't have access to um, because he, and I've said this publicly, uh, it's got me in trouble before, but today, if you look at the United States Congress and you look at the intensity on the side of Republicans, it is very likely we're gonna win uh, control of Congress. Uh, the one thing that can keep that from happening is if Trump gets out there again and gets the Democrats' intensity up. Uh, so he just needs to go away. Um, the party needs him to go away. And based on what he said in the last 24 hours on, on Putin, the country needs him to go away. Well, Celinda and Ed, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has just been great. Um, we uh, appreciate uh, all the attendees out there too.
Um, the Mansfield Center is having some additional dialogues coming up. I know we've got one with Condi Rice and uh, the former ambassador to Russia, Mike McFall. We've also got one with Sam Donaldson. Um, you can check our website for uh, the whole list. Um, if you would like to, again, support our work at the Mansfield Center, you can find a link uh, to do that in the chat. Um, Celinda and, um, and, and Ed, once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we would love to have you back when your book comes out. Um, and with that, I'll say goodbye from the Mansfield Center. Thank you so much.